Hi, it is so great to get to talk to you too. I'm so excited for this movie. This seems like it was made for me. So thank you in advance. But Amy, uh, first to you, I want to start with Splat. This looks like such a fun character to be able to design and to get to find all the physics of. So talk to me about being able to animate Splat. Yes. Uh, you're right. Splat is a very fun character. I think when we early on, we were seeing the character designs from Jin Kim and we were like, wow, this is so cool. We've never seen a character like this before, but how are we going to animate this? Because it's also very challenging with all the tentacles and uh, little nubbins. So um, I think Splat has no face to communicate. So for us, it's really trying to sell a performance um, with body language and things like timing and spacing and people coming up, artists coming up with really imaginative choices on how to sell what Splat is trying to communicate in a moment. So we were often laughing quite a lot on this film because animators were coming, uh, coming up with such entertaining choices for Splat. That's so great. And now, Justin, I'm going to ask a similar question to the environments crew as well. You've worked on so many of the amazing Disney properties we've come to love in this last decade. But maybe with the exception of Ralph Breaks the Internet, this is the first time you get to be otherworldly. Does it is it kind of freeing as an artist to kind of leave Earth behind for a little bit? Sure. I mean, I think one of the things that we we've talked about a lot is that especially in our last, I don't know, last 10 years of films, we're, we're spending huge amounts of time researching. We're talking to all of these experts about um, cultures and, and all the specific things that we're trying to represent. And you can't really do much of that for this film. I mean, we, we talked to a whole bunch of experts about um, different ideas and different things that we were pulling from, but there's not specific reference for a lot, of, a lot of these things. And I think what's really exciting as an animator is we like challenges. We like trying to communicate things in a difficult way. We like the fact that there's a whole world of creatures that don't have faces and we don't know how they're supposed to move and we can do whatever we want. Um, and so for us, it's really fun to be able to look at these things and go, well, there's not a correct answer for this. So mm -hmm. I'm just going to do the thing that I think is fun and weird and makes sense for this moment um, and, and hope it flies. And there was a lot of stuff that flew on this movie that uh, we were surprised. Everyone was like, yeah, it's awesome. Let's do it. That's I can't wait to see it on the screen. Now, Amy, same question to you. Is it kind of freeing as an artist in this way, much like Justin just mentioned? Oh, totally. Yeah, we've been part of so many films that are very grounded in, you know, research, like Justin was just saying. And I think being a part of a world that is such imagination um, and working with Don and Kui, our directors, Justin and I have worked with them before. Um, they're very trusting of our team. And they were saying to Justin and I up front, we want to really have fun with the animation on this show. And what I love about working with them is the trust that they put into our team and our group of animators. It really makes it feel like um, the artists are bringing something to the table and they're really getting to own um, what they bring, whether it's a performance, of course, as, as long as it's serving the story, but they're really great at um, letting people come up with, with their ideas to put into the scene, which is really cool. But yeah, I think this, this film was, it was definitely challenging because a lot of times you're starting with, with, you know, a blank piece of paper because there isn't, we're so used to looking at research and reference and how something might move. So uh, this was a lot more ima imaginative and creative choices than I think uh, we usually do. And from your blank piece of paper and imagination to a bunch of kids, uh, bedrooms and everything else in the future, that's just such a, a really cool thing that you bring to life through your art. So I'm going to stick with you for just a second here, Amy. But at the press event earlier this week, you mentioned that you would say that this film has a modern Disney performance with a post-war post approach. And I'm wondering if you could kind of elaborate that for our listeners. Yeah, Justin, early, Justin and I, very early on, we were meeting with our supervising team for like six months talking about the animation style for this film. And we were uh, looking through those films that you were just mentioning, things like Peter Pan, Sleeping Beauty. And I remember looking at a lot of uh, Captain Hook in Smee scenes and animation is 24 frames for every one second. And so if you just step through and see the choices that those animators are coming up with, um, we're very pose based and coming up with interesting poses and the way you get 
from one pose to the next, they were making really interesting choices back then, things that we'll call like shape change and even timing and spacing. Um, and then also the more modern films, we looked at a lot of Treasure Planet uh, work with Silver and Doppler, because um, we're always inspired by, Glenn Keane is an incredible animator, Sergio Pablos, um, and many of the others. But what they're getting in, in that film is a lot of that push caricature, but there's a lot of really nuanced performances in that film where you really have to sell that emotion. And we thought that they were handling that really well. So dissecting what we really loved about those scenes and trying to find ways to bring that into the animation for our film. And we were inspired by Jin Kim's character designs because had his character designs been more um, of that naturalistic feel, I don't think we would have been able to push the style in the way that we did. That's so great. Now, Justin, you know, we all kind of grew up in that Disney renaissance. They had a distinct style, that Glenn Keane kind of style from Little Mermaid onwards. And I'm just wondering, uh, we've got a lot of Disney geeks out there uh, on our audience, and I'm one of those Disney geeks. I just want to hear from someone that's ahead of animation. How would you describe like the kind of more modern approach to animation that is uh, going on at Disney, maybe from things like from Tangled onward? It seems like we're in this new era of animation. So how would you describe that sure what an interesting question um i i think in a lot of ways there is something specific to disney um which is that we everyone i think is trying to get sort of nuanced and very specific and very human choices and i think everyone is also trying to um figure out a way to combine that with design in a way that's compelling and everyone does a really great job i think the way that I think Glenn had a huge impact on this. I'm talking about this a little bit secondhand. Amy might be able to give you a better answer because she was here on Tangle. Well, I was here a little bit on Tangle. Um, but uh, I think Glenn's influence on Tangle, I think really set up a world where um, we were trying to break out of the constraints of CG and that we were trying to think about things in a more 2D way and think about how you design shapes as they move in a way that CG doesn't necessarily lend itself to because when you make a model and you make a rig, the answer is there for you in every angle. But when you're turning a character in 2D, you're kind of solving that problem again every time to make it the best answer for, um, for that angle. And that does not come without a lot of work in CG. And so I think what, what Glenn really brought to um the current era of of disney animation is just this idea of like we want all of that anatomy we want all of that detail and we want all of that sincerity and we want all of that realism but we want really want to be thoughtful about how we're moving it and how we're posing it and how we're designing it on every single frame um to get something that has all of that gravitas and all of the the naturalism and all of the observation to it but is is curated in a way that's like that's what animation is about animation is about mm -hmm. like taking life and curating it to the point where um you've told this story as simply and as beautifully as you can using every drawing that you get for each frame of that second or two seconds or the whole movie that's that's wonderful. Amy, did you have a follow up to that too? kind of how you would describe sort of this more modern approach to animation from Disney? I mean, Justin put it so well, but I going back to working with Glenn on Tangled, I, I do feel like that was kind of the start of it. And when I look at my own work as an animator, uh, before getting the chance to work with Glenn, my work took such a huge leap forward because of the things that Justin is mentioning with really designing those poses. And every pose should tell a story or have a thought in them. And Glenn and the directors, uh, Nathan and Byron were so great at what is the character thinking at any moment and any mm -hmm. frame and really getting into that with animation, um, you know, with the computer, it's very easy to just have a character constantly moving and over gesturing. And it was getting into the simplicity of what is this shot trying to tell and minimizing all of that move movement because you need to be usually it's like what is the character thinking and what's happening inside their head and you're selling that oftentimes with very nuanced 
performance choices that are happening in your face and, and body language, of course. Well, thank you both for that uh, look into the geekiness of the creator studio in there. I really appreciate that. Now, Amy, uh, it was mentioned, speaking of legends of 2D animation, uh, it was mentioned that there is a dog in this movie. It's going to be one that we all come to love, named yeah. Legend. And I'm wondering if you could tell my listeners a bit about the story uh, behind the naming of Legend. Yeah, uh, legend. Uh, so there is a story artist named Bernie Mattinson, who's been at the studio for 60 plus years. And Don was mentioning how he has worked with Bernie on so many of his films. And at one point, uh, Bernie said, Don, you really need to have a character that's going to ground this film. So, uh, you should think about putting a dog in this film. So, uh, Don and Quee and the story artist talked about that idea and that's how legend came to be and because bernie's legacy um they would always call bernie legend and so that's why they named uh the dog in our film legend and legend is a scene stealer i think we all love legend so much he's just a happy dog and he's a dog uh he doesn't necessarily have you know, all these thoughts and feelings other than what a dog would have. He's happy all the time, even in uh, crises when the other characters are running for their lives. Legend's just like, wow, we're, you know, running on these cool creatures or whatever's happening in that moment. So that's so great. Now I'm going to try to sneak in a couple more questions. My time is fleeting, but Justin, uh, can you talk about uh, how you go about adjusting the animation style to any uh, areas of the voice acting that comes along with this? We've got a great cast in Jake Gyllenhaal and Gabrielle Union, and of course, Dennis Quaid. And I mean, the list goes on, but uh, I know like when they were doing Pink, uh, Pocahontas, they would actually kind of use some live action models to feature the animation as well. I'm just wondering uh, if there's adjustments that are made throughout the process of animation due to the actors as well sure yeah i mean a, a lot of times we will the characters have, in a lot of cases have been designed before before people are cast um, and we'll do a little bit of testing before then where we're kind of like figuring out what um what the character needs to be but when we finally get the actors and we push to get that as early as humanly possible um when we finally get the voice actors that's when we kind of things lock into place in a lot of cases um, we had ideas for for how Jaeger would work. Jaeger is even in his design kind of big and bombastic, and we knew that he was going to be athletic and really fun. And then you get Dennis's reads, and mm -hmm. they are some of my favorite like, voice <laughs> acting performances that I've ever heard because um, he's just so dynamic and so broad and goes all the way there, but he's also really good at, at bringing it back for more naturalistic performances. And there's a lot of cases where we're pulling, we we record video of all of those sessions um, and the animators will often look at them and, and steal different things. There's a lot of different, like Jake Gyllenhaal has some very specific mouth shapes that we steal for Searcher. Um, Mallory Walters, who's the supervisor on Ethan, spent a lot of time looking at um, Jabuki in, in his film work and also his standup and finding different gestures that that he does all the time um and there's a lot of that incorporated into our film it's it's that kind of stuff that makes things really specific especially when right. you have 120 animators animating and you need the character needs to feel like the character and not 120 people Absolutely. And this is my last question. It's been so great to get to talk to you. And before I say my last question, just thank you for the art and creativity that you put into the world, because honestly, it just, it means a lot to a lot of people. So thank you for all that you do. But my last question is a fun one. I'm going to ask everybody I talked to today. What is your favorite adventure story? It could be a novel, could be a movie, TV show, whatever. And uh, Justin, you look like you're terrified to answer that. So I'm going to go to Amy first. <laughs> oh my gosh. Uh, my favorite adventure story Gosh, this is such a good question that I have never been asked. Um, <laughs> I do have an answer if you want me to go. First. Okay, go I ahead, do, Justin. Yes. <laughs> I, don't, I don't know that this is the kind of movie that uh, inspires this film, but one of my favorite films, and I, for some reason, I don't watch a lot of movies more than once, but uh, the Coen Brothers True Grit, I've seen. Oh, uh, so yes. Times. I love that movie. It's so, it's so great to watch. I love I mean, I love the Coen Brothers aesthetic, but it's such fun performances. It's a great movie. Jeff Bridges is amazing in it. And then the, the, just those new Westerns, even 310 to Yuma is a great new, more modern take on a Western. So, all right, Amy, you're up. I only have a couple seconds left too. So I, 
I need to get an answer from you. I know. And I don't feel like I ha- I'm like, okay, what's an adventure? I mean, obviously I know what an adventure story is, but uh, <laughs> I'm thinking it through all my favorite films and none of them are adventures. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no worries. Maybe sometime you can come back on my show and uh, we'll talk about it then. Okay. But, yeah. but really, truly, thank you both so much for all you do. And thank you for your time today. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much.